Is good. Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the six and six and seven class spring 2018. Uh, I presume all of you are here are, are registered for section one. Okay, there is a section two for the class as well. A good 50 or so students who are going to actually follow along online. That's the reason we are recording and you shouldn't sit in front of the camera there. <laughs> uh, so that's the reason we are going to be recording every class because I have to make it available to the other students. So bear with us uh, as we set things up in every class. Okay. So my name is Prashant Chinoy and I will be the instructor for this course. And what I will do today is to give an overview of uh, the syllabus for this class what topics we are going to cover in the class and also just do a quick introduction to distributed systems as to what this topic is about. Okay, And then starting next time we will start looking at specific issues uh, that we will uh, go over today. Okay, So uh, let us start with the course syllabus. Uh, the course syllabus is has been posted online. Okay, so you should have received a mail from me yesterday indicating what's the course web page. It's also listed here. Okay, and there you will go and if you go there, you'll see the course syllabus. Much of what is in there, I'm going to just cover here. So you don't have to worry, but if you have to refer to it at any point, you can actually go there and uh, look for it. Okay, as I already said, there are two sections for this class. Uh, you guys will all be coming to the lectures. The other class is going to follow along uh, through uh, video recordings that we are going to capture, but otherwise both classes are going to do exactly the same work, okay, same homework, same exams, same labs, everything else is the same. Okay? So for the purposes of grading, it's one bigger class, but there are two sections of it. Okay? All right. So as far as course staff are concerned, uh, we are around at around 100 students, so it's a pretty large class. So as a result, I have a set of uh, TAs and course assistants that will help me. Okay, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about that. But before that, I say something about the course assistants. I want to mention that we will be all having office hours. Okay, my office hours will be on Mondays and Wednesdays, starting at 3:45, which is right after the lectures. Okay. Uh, and uh, the course assistants will also be having some office hours which I'm going to post next time. Okay, I'm, I don't have the final office hours yet. I will announce them in the next class. But essentially there will be somebody you can talk to every day of the week from Monday to Friday. Okay, so I'll have office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays and they will have office hours Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. Okay. Uh, so the TA for the course is Ami. I put pictures there so you can associate names and faces. Uh, and there are three grading assistants, Abhay, Neha and Sri Krishna, you will see their pictures there. For most practical purposes, you might end up actually seeing Ami or one of the other course assistants who have office hours, but there will be others who will be helping with grading and so on, because just so that you know who are all the course staff for the class. Okay, uh, my office hours will actually be in my office, which is in room 302 in this building. Any questions? Okay, so uh, the course will have a textbook and uh, the textbook is the third edition of Distributed Systems by Tannenbaum. Okay, it is, uh, that's what it looks like. Okay, but you don't actually need to buy a printed copy because the book is freely available from the authors at no charge. Okay, so you can download a PDF copy from that link also that link is also posted on the syllabus. Okay? That's for the third edition for the book which is the official textbook for the class. Okay? The second edition which is what we had used until last year is also available as a free downloadable PDF and it would be helpful if you can get both PDFs while you are at it. Okay? Because they eliminated some material from the uh, third edition and I might use a little bit of that still in the course because I think it's important. Okay, but for most part, you should be okay if you just get the more recent edition of the book. Okay, should you want a printed copy, you can certainly order it. It's very inexpensive, even the printed copy, but you don't have to. 
because the, it's a free textbook that the authors make available. Okay, any questions about the book? Okay. There are also a set of reading materials that I will make available as part of the lectures okay, and we will post links to them as we go along. Okay. So as far as the course outline and the topics that we will cover in the course is are concerned, uh, we will do a quick introduction that today's class really uh, about what distributed systems are, what are their advantages and so on. Next time we are going to talk about architectures used in modern distributed systems. If you take any distributed system, it will fall into one of these several architectures. We will talk about what they are, how they work, what they are used for and so on. Okay. And then we will talk about distributed communication, okay, which is really going to be RPCs, RMIs and uh, stream oriented communication. It's going to take a few lectures. We will talk about processes, scheduling and virtualization. We will talk about what are threads which you should already know but we will look at more advanced concepts as far as threads and processor scheduling is concerned in a distributed context. Okay. We will talk about code and process migration. We will spend a good deal of time talking about virtualizing processes and threads and so on and understand how they work in distributed systems. Okay. Then we will spend a little bit of time talking about distributed naming. Okay, and their implementation that includes things like directory services, DNS, uh, the domain name system and so on. Okay. And then uh, we will get to this topic which we call canonical problems in distributed systems. We will spend a sequence of lectures talking about variety of different problems. Okay, distributed locking which is mutual exclusion, leader election, we will talk about synchronization and, and a whole slew of issues, distributed transactions and what not. So that is going to take several classes and that is really the core of the concepts that you really need to know as far as distributed systems are concerned. Okay, so uh, once we have gotten past that point, we will talk about uh, replication and consistency techniques uh, and fault tolerance, they are all related issues. We will talk about how distributed systems make use of them or how to deal with uh, things like failures. Uh, assuming time permits, which I believe at this point we should have time unless there are snow holidays or something. We will have uh, one lecture on security in distributed systems and then there are a whole slew of advanced topics which include middleware, world wide web, cloud computing, uh, data centers, multimedia. We won't get through all of them but we will basically start from here and see how many we can get through. Okay, so those are all case studies if you will that bring together all of those concepts that uh, we would have covered until then. Okay, so that is in a nutshell what this course is going to look like the next 25 or so lectures. Okay. Uh, if you go to the course web page which is here, okay, you will see that the schedule for the lecture is already up, the entire semester schedule is up tells you what topics are going to be covered on what day and what not. It also tells you when assignments come out, when they are due. All the exams have already been posted. The midterm is going to be on March 26th. The final exam is going to be a take home exam on May 4th. So the schedule for the entire semester is already set. Okay, that should tell you what order topics are going to be covered, when they are going to be covered and so on. Of course, all of that is subject to change because in the winter you sometimes have snow holidays or there are other issues that cause a change but by and large we will follow this schedule. Okay. All right. So going back to the lecture. Okay. So now as far as grading is concerned we will have uh, five or so homeworks and for the in-class section only occasional in-class quizzes as well as Moodle quizzes that is about 10 percent of the grade. Okay. Uh, the programming assignments are 45 percent of the grade. There are typically three programming assignments in the class. Okay. They cover uh, collectively 45 percent of the grade. Two exams okay, which are 40 percent. 20% for each exam, one for the midterm, one for the final. There is a short term paper uh, that uh, you will have to turn in at the end of the semester. Okay, that's like an extended homework where you pick a topic, uh, do a little bit of your own deep dive, understand the topic, read some papers, write a report. 
Okay, this just gives you some skills of learning on your by your, on your own. Okay, not everything is something I have to teach you. You should have enough background by then to go and dig deeper into a topic of your choosing. Okay, there's a term paper that's four percent. Class participation, online discussion is uh, gets you one percent. Okay, so. Uh, that 1% can sometimes make a difference between one grade or the next grade up. If you are at the boundary and you are done, come to class or uh, participated in discussions, you actually might get a bump. If you don't, then you will be where your grade actually puts you. Yeah, so take that, I mean it's a very small percentage but in some cases it has actually made a difference to someone's grade. Okay, there's a course mailing list, you are already on it if you are registered or if you register Spire puts you on it and I use that occasionally to make more important announcements. Okay. And there's also an online discussion board on Piazza. I already sent mail yesterday pointing you to it. Please make sure you sign up for it because that's where you can always ask questions. Okay. You don't always have to come to office hours. You can always ask a question about anything you wish there. Questions of a personal nature saying, what's my grade for homework three? You shouldn't post that obviously. You should ask me via email or come ask me uh, personally. Okay, so anything that relates broadly to the course, clarifications, discussions, you can actually go to Piazza and use the discussion forum. That's the link to the uh, online forums. Okay, beyond that, there is a, yes, there's a question there. Uh, so if we don't need to get in touch with you or ask you a question, you prefer email rather than a private Piazza message? Uh, you could send a private Piazza message. That's fine. Just don't post uh, something publicly that's of a personal nature. Okay. Okay. So that should be fine. But make sure that's actually a private message. Yeah. That's fine. E email is also fine. But yeah, you could use the private feature in Piazza. That should not be a problem. Okay. There's a YouTube channel for the class, which is actually more meant for the online section students, which is where the lectures are going to be posted. Of course, you can take advantage of that uh, and uh, review lectures and so on. Okay. Keep in mind that should not be an excuse to stop coming to class because all the lectures are recorded and what not. Okay. So there will be some sort of an on, uh, incentive for coming to class because there are class participation points as well. Okay. And as far as the prereqs are concerned, there are no hard and fast prereqs for the course. Okay, there's a general assumption that you know something about operating systems because this is a graduate version of the class. Okay, if you haven't taken a class, then I can point you to some undergraduate textbooks. You are then responsible for making sure you know something about undergrad operating systems. Okay, I'm not going to actually check for any prereqs. If you feel you don't have the background for this class or don't know if you have the background for this class, come talk to me. Okay, I'm always happy to discuss that uh, issue with you, but uh, by and large when this has come up previously, students have been able to do just fine by having an undergrad textbook by their uh, side and referring to it every once in a while as they need. Okay, of course it goes without saying that the other prereq is you should know programming because 45% of the grades is actually on labs and programming assignments. Okay, we are going to do all the assignments in Python this semester. Okay, until last year we said use whatever language you want of your choosing but because the class keeps growing just for our own uh, benefit in terms of being able to grade all the assignments in a timely fashion we are going to standardize the labs on Python. Okay? If you really don't know Python you should learn it soon but, but I assume that it's uh, something that most people know at this point in time. Okay, any questions about the grading or any the, of these details? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, so for the programming assignments, in terms of our own, like uh, we're stuck on something and we Google, like how do you do this in Python? Do we need to cite everything in comments in terms of where we get stuff? Okay, there's a question about uh, if you uh, look for something, you find material on the web, can you have to cite it? We will provide you enough instructions that you will know what should be done. Obviously, uh, you shouldn't take someone else's code from the class. But it's fine to look up uh, uh, material on the web and so long as you cite it, that should be fine. Okay. Any other questions? 
okay so i mentioned class participation already you get some extra points for class participation okay i do want to mention uh, laptop and device usage in the class because several of you have machines open uh, the standard policy for the class is not to use laptops in class not to use phones in class or tablets the reason is it just ends up being a distraction okay you would lose interest in whatever i'm saying you start surfing the web everyone behind you starts looking at your screen instead of <laughs> listening to them so it has a bad multiplicative effect that i just decided it's not worth the trouble if you spend the time showing up spend a little bit of effort trying to listen if you don't understand something ask i'm happy to always spend as much time as is needed to uh, explain whatever material you need to understand okay i will make the slides available before class so if you need to take notes you can actually print the slides and bring them and take notes. okay so you don't need to worry about that okay i want to enforce that policy more strictly because uh, you know, people sometimes just forget and start uh, using laptops or worse texting on their phones and whatnot and i just want to discourage that up front okay all right so any questions you have covered the syllabus we are going to start talking about what are distributed systems next and i can take a minute to answer any questions yes um what's the collaboration policy on assignments what is the collaboration policy on assignments, assignments. okay so the assignments which we will talk about at great length uh, will be group based okay so you can have groups of two to do your labs okay that group can do whatever it wants together you are not supposed to work outside of that group to actually take code or share code and so on you can always talk to any of us saying how should i address this particular issue you can post questions on piazza but not share code across your group yeah very straight forward policy but you will be doing group work not required you can always do individual work but we allow groups of two okay any other questions about the lab or anything else okay so let's get started talk about uh, so the rest of this class which is about an hour uh, is going to be on what are distributed systems why should we care and we'll talk a little bit about some details okay the class actually is officially titled distributed and operating systems okay which means we are going to cover topics more advanced topics in operating systems as well as distributed systems in many cases those topics are one and the same because anything that you relate to in distributed operating system also relates to more general purpose distributed system okay but keep in mind that we actually will cover issues in both os and distributed system okay so in any case why should we worry about or learn about distributed systems okay so these systems are now common place today practically any computing system that you interact with okay is distributed in some shape or form okay yeah, so if you look at the world wide web it's a very large global scale distributed system uh, if you look at any service that you pr pretty much access today whether it's google or facebook or e-commerce stores such as amazon or any of these sites they are very large scale distributed system okay they are massively replicated they runs on tens or hundreds of thousands of machines so it's worth asking how do you build a system that runs on such a large scale uh, across the globe okay you probably know how to write programs that run on your machine okay but how do you write programs that run on 10 machines 100 machines 1000 machines okay those are the kinds of things we worry about in distributed systems okay yeah. uh, then there are many types of distributed systems you have peer to peer file sharing systems you must have heard of bittorrent and similar system okay those are distributed systems in their own right we'll talk about how they actually work how they are different from these other kinds of system that are called client server systems okay uh, and then there are systems that include grid computing cluster computing cloud computing you may have heard of these terms you may know what they are if you haven't heard of them that's okay we are going to learn more about them in this class okay these are all different types of distributed systems that have evolved over the ages and then there is something here called seti at home that's basically a large distributed system that's based on this concept of volunteer computing again if you have not heard of it we will get to this maybe next time or the week after okay so the take away is uh, most of the computing systems that you encounter today okay are distributed in some shape or form so it's useful to understand 
how these real systems work, what are the principles that underlie the design of these distributed systems. Okay, that's really the reason why you should be wanting to know more about this topic. Yeah, but let me start with the definition, what is actually a distributed system more formally. Okay. So here is a very simple but formal definition which says it is a uh, multiple connected processors uh, that work together. Okay. Put another way, it is a collection of independent computers okay, that appear to its user as a single coherent system. Okay. So what this says is there are, there is more than one processor. Okay. They could actually be processors on independent machines. Yeah, or they could be processors on the same machine, but typically on independent machines, they are connected by a network, so the processors are interconnected. Okay? And they give an abstraction to the users as if they are a single large system of some shape, some uh, form. Okay, so that is an example, not an example rather, of definition of a distributed system and this is a very broad definition. Okay? It covers everything from parallel machines where you can have very large symmetric multiprocessing machines to cluster computing to the cloud computing and so on. Okay? So where you have lots of servers that are connected to one another. And we will encounter various types of distributed systems. I will talk about the history of these systems and you will see how they evolved, what flavors they come in and so on. Okay. okay, so what is the advantage of uh, having systems being distributed? Okay. There are some uh, advantages and some disadvantages. Okay. So let's start with the advantages. Okay. The first thing is it enables communication. Okay. Because your machines that are connected over a network, it follows that any processes or applications that run over, that, over these machines can communicate over that network. Okay. It also allows people to communicate, but it allows processes to communicate with one another. Okay. It, because you can communicate, okay, you can enable sharing of resources across machines. Okay. Simple example is you can have process A access files stored on a different machine. Okay. Now you are actually sharing the storage space on a second machine. Okay. You can have process A run additional tasks on a second machine. Now you are sharing the computing resources on that second machine and so on and so forth. Okay. Essentially because there is communication, you can have sharing of resources, which is a good advantage because you are no longer limited to the resources that are on your machine. You can take advantage of resources that are on more than one machine. Okay. Uh, and because you can now share resources, this gives you better economics in terms of price and performance. Okay. In the old days before distributed systems became commonplace, Okay. If you are needed to run an application that couldn't run on a machine because it needed more resources, your only uh, alternative was to buy a bigger machine. Okay. You need more memory, you put more memory or buy a memory, uh, machine with more RAM. Okay. You need more processors, buy a machine that is more capable. Okay. In this case, because you are distributed, okay, you basically can buy more machines, not a bigger machine okay, and share the resources across that machine. Okay. And because smaller machines are cheaper than very large machines, that gives you better price to performance ratio. That is the economic argument. Okay. So a very simple example is how supercomputing machines were built. Okay. The very old days supercomputing machines are one gigantic box that had a very capable processor and lots of memory. Okay. An alternative way people thought was why not just have lots of inexpensive servers that are connected over a high speed network. Okay. Eventually, that is the model that one. Today, all supercomputing machines are essentially clusters of servers okay. because that gives you better economics rather than making a machine bigger and bigger. You can just buy more uh, smaller machines and just put them together as a cluster. Okay. Now, there are many other advantages such as reliability, scalability and potential for incremental growth. Okay. Reliability simply says that if one machine fails in your system because there are other machines they can take over the tasks of whatever the application was doing and your application can continue to function. Okay? Or you can replicate your data on more than one machine which gives you better reliability. If one machine or the disk dies, you can get your uh, data, still get access to your data because you made copies of it. Okay? All of that relates to reliability. Yes, scalability says that as you increase the number of machines, you can take advantage of all of the resources on those machines. Okay? So essentially if you have n machines in a cluster, 
Okay. The total processing power that you have is n times the processing power of a single machine. Okay. So if you have a web server that runs on a cluster of n machines, that says that you should be able to scale as n grows the capacity of your web server. Okay. You should be able to serve more and more requests which far exceed the capacity of any single machine. Okay. That's a scalability argument. Okay. It's easier said than done as you will see. Okay, because scalability is not always linear. There are all sorts of other bottlenecks that cause actual scalability to be sublinear in nature. Okay, and potential for incremental growth simply says that you can grow your distributed system over time. Okay, if your if your server or your application becomes more popular, you can add more servers to your application to the cluster. Okay, that's also an argument as to why cloud computing has become popular. Because it allows you to get server capacity on demand, okay, which is all incremental growth. If your application suddenly becomes popular, you can immediately scale up your capacity. Okay, that's an advantage you get with distributed systems. Okay. And there are several disadvantages as well. Okay. Because you are distributed in nature, your application has become more complex than a simple centralized application. Okay. The multiple copies of your processes or multiple processes themselves that are running on different machines. They have to communicate with one another. You as a distributed system designer have to design such an application. It makes your job harder. Okay? It makes the programming languages that you write these applications on more complex. The OSs also become more complex because they have to enable this distribution. Okay. It goes without saying that network connectivity is crucial to a distributed system. If your interconnect breaks, your distributed system stops working. Okay. That's not true for a centralized application because it doesn't depend on a network, it can continue to run. Okay. The last but not least is the security and privacy implications of making things distributed. Okay. Because you have made your processes and data available over a network, okay, they are also vulnerable to malicious users trying to get access to it just as they can be accessed by your legitimate processes and clients. Okay? So security becomes a bigger problem. Okay? Privacy of your data is also uh, impacted because you made things distributed and available. Okay? So those are the pros and cons of uh, why uh, distributed systems are good in some ways and not so good in other ways. Any questions on this? Okay. So, let's talk about uh, another dimension which is also in some sense something a uh, design consideration which is called transparency in distributed system. Okay, so what does this mean? So if you think about a distributed system, I said it consists of more than one machine interconnected over a network. Okay, and you run your applications on these machines. Okay. Now if you think about this from a user's perspective, you have to ask an important question as a system designer, which is what aspects of your system are you going to make visible to the user and what aspects are you going to hide from your user? Okay? And you might not think that's an important question, but it actually is from a user's perspective because it can vastly make the system become more usable or very uh, or less usable. Okay? And the general principle is if you can hide something from the user, you should you should not make it visible because it actually makes the system easier to use. Okay. Here's a good example. Okay. I'm going to take one of these rows. So, so there are many properties that you can hide from a user. Okay. They're all listed in this table. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to use two, one or two to give you an example. So let's take replication transparency. Okay. Replication transparency says that the fact that the system is replicated is hidden from the user. Okay. So what's a good example of it? Okay, take an exact, let's take uh, a search engine like Google. Okay, it runs on hundreds of thousands of machines. Okay, what's the user interface for Google? Okay, it's a search box. Okay, it doesn't reveal any information about how it works. Okay, it lets you search. It doesn't say connect to the 10,000th server to send your query. It will figure that out for you. Okay. So they have hidden all aspects of the system from the user. Okay. And in this case, that's a good thing because you are simply trying to search for information. You don't care what server is going to service your query. You just want an answer so you can get on with your work. Okay. So that just 
is an example of replication transparency where you have hidden uh, the fact that the system is replicated. And there are many such things like uh, failure transparency, okay, which says that if parts of the system fail, keep it transparent to the user. Yeah, so in this case, let's say just continuing with this example, you send a search query to Google. They send it off to one of their servers. Let's say the server fails before it responds to you. Okay? Now, if they, if they have implemented logic that actually figures out that server failed and resends that query to another server and gets you an answer, and you just get an answer, you don't know that something went wrong, you will feel you will be happier. Okay, on the other hand, if your search query never returns a result, it just sits there spinning your browser, you are not happy because you are waiting for an answer that you are not getting because something has failed in the back end. Okay? Failure transparency says that servers may fail, components of the system may fail, but we will actually make it transparent to the user. We will recover from whatever the problem is and the users don't need to know or don't need to care about such things. Okay? Now, if you try to incorporate all of these features into your system, you have to understand that all of these sound good for the user, but it makes your job as a system designer a lot more complex. Okay? You have to design for all of those things. Okay? You have to figure out what to hide, what to do in the back and how do you recover from failures, how do you achieve a lot of those properties. Okay? It is not required that you have transparency along every dimension. Okay? But if you can hide it and the user doesn't need to know, that is a better design principle overall. Okay? Because you are reducing complexity for the user, you are increasing complexity for the system. Okay? But that is a reasonable trade-off in many cases. Okay? All right. So, we will come back to all of these issues as we go and uh, start talking about more details. Okay, this is just to give you some uh, notion of why designing these systems is complicated. Yes, question. Is there, is there a need where we need to show actually these things to the user? Is there an application we need to no, not hide it, but show it? Okay, that is a good question. And the question is, uh, are there scenarios where you actually have to reveal some of these features and not make it transparent? Okay. There may be many systems where you may not want to make something transparent. Right? So, example is if you have, uh, if you want to SSH to a machine on a network or a cluster, you are going to log into a specific machine. The fact that there is a cluster of machine is not hidden from the user because you want the user to actually go to a specific machine. Okay? So, there are many scenarios where just because you have more than one server doesn't mean you hide all of those details. But in some cases, you do want to hide them. In other cases, you don't want to hide them. You have to decide what the user needs to do to accomplish their work and what you should do as a system designer. Okay? Yes, question. What does the resource mean? What does the what? A resource. Oh, question is what does a resource mean? Okay, resource is used broadly. It could mean a machine. It could mean a file. It could mean a URL, any object that you are accessing okay, in the system. Any other questions here? Okay, so we will come back to some of these issues. This is just a very high level overview of uh, uh, what are distributed systems today. Okay? So open distributed systems. So these are a class of distributed systems that offer services but make their APIs openly available and published. Okay? So you can have proprietary distributed systems that the API is not known. It's only known to the designers. They are not published to anyone else. Okay, so only the people who wrote those distributed systems can decide how the clients talk to the server and so on because the interfaces are hidden. Okay? But by and large, most of the distributed systems that you see today are open in the sense of they have opened their APIs. Doesn't mean the code is open. Okay, code could also be open, but that is not what open distributed systems mean. It means at least the APIs are open. Okay? That means the APIs are published. Okay, so if you take, let us say, Google Maps. Okay, Google Maps has a published API. You can write a client that talks to the Google Maps server through that API and do whatever it is that you need to do. Okay? So more, many of these applications that you see, they will also have an API. Many times the clients, you don't actually worry about the API, you just get a client and use the client to talk to the service. But if you want to write your own client, you use the APIs to do it. Okay? So this is a, a good way to design your systems. If you make the code available, well and good. But in many cases, having the APIs available actually enables developers to use your system in interesting ways that you may not even have thought of. Okay. So, you know, basically it gives you 
uh, many benefits like interoperability, portability, extensibility and so on. Okay, so that's a good design principle to have where at the very least you should tell someone else who may use your distributed system what interfaces you expect them to interact with your system. Okay, so which are the APIs. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about scalability. Okay, I said scale, a good thing about distributed systems is that they can scale as you add more and more machines to your system. But I also said that this is easier said than done. Okay. The reason for this is uh, it is often hard to distribute everything you have in your system. Okay. It may be that the service, some aspects of the services may be centralized. It prevents you from scaling up. Some parts of the data may be centralized or your algorithms may be centralized. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, centralized service simply means the whole application is centralized. Okay, so then there is no distributed system other than the server service runs on one machine. Okay, clients just connect to that machine and interact with it. But if you are lots send lot of requests to that machines, the machine saturates and you can't scale up anymore. Okay, that's a centralized service. Okay, you can replicate the service. In that case, it's no longer centralized. You have the same server running on more than one machine. Users can connect to specific replicas or you can have a load balancer that will receive the request and have one of the service or run of the replicas service your request. Okay? That will allow you to scale better, okay? but it will make your system design more complicated. Okay? The second bottleneck that you often see. Okay, the first one is easy to resolve. You replicate the server. The second one says my data may not be replicated. Okay, The code that accesses the data may be replicated but all the data resides in one file or one database. Okay, So in this case what is going to happen is as you scale your service up, okay, eventually your data will become the bottleneck. Access to the data will become the bottleneck. So let's say your lot of uh, uh, servers that all access data from one database. Okay. If the, the, all the servers start sending queries or transactions to the database, eventually your database will saturate. Okay. You may have scaled up the code, but your data is still centralized in one place. Okay. And then if that machine saturates, then again you have a bottleneck. Okay. So what could you do to address this bottleneck? Okay, so I heard cache and I heard distribute or replicate. Okay, so you can do both of those things. We look at it. Okay, you can employ caching of frequently accessed data that helps. Okay, you can also replicate. Okay, same thing you did for the service. You replicate the data. Okay, again that's that brings its whole uh, set of complications. Whenever your data replication, you have to ensure consistency. Okay, you change one copy if the other copies are not changed at the same time you are going to have some copies of your data that are outdated. Okay, if you have three copies of your database and you have make a transaction in one and update some record, if the other records are out of date, then your application is not consistent anymore. Okay? So whenever you replicate data, there is a whole slew of problems of what consistency do you want to provide, what guarantees do you want to provide on the consistency and so on and so forth. Okay, when we come to replication eventually in chapter 7, we will look at this in a lot more detail. Okay? So this sounds easy, but it is much harder to actually do well in practice. Okay? And last but lastly, the algorithms that you use in your code may actually make centralized assumptions. Okay? That is also bad. Okay? If, you are, if you want your uh, algorithms to scale up, the algorithm itself has to be distributed. That is not the same as replicating the code. If the algorithm makes some centralized assumption, you can't just run it on multiple machines. You have to decide what parts of the code can be distributed or replicated and change how you write the program itself. Okay. So, so those are all issues to consider when you design your distributed system. Okay? You may not have to do all of those things. You might say, I may keep my data centralized because I don't want to deal with the consistency hassle. Okay, but I will replicate my service, it will access one copy of the data. And that's okay if the service is compute intensive, but not I.O. intensive. Okay, so if you are not I.O. intensive, your disk load is light, so it may not cause your data to be a bottle. So what you decide to replicate depends on the scenario. There is no one answer. Okay? It sounds good to replicate everything, but that complicates your system design significantly. Okay. Okay, so scaling techniques, okay, what can you do to make 
uh, good system design. So there are some principles you should follow. Okay, and some of these may not make sense because we haven't covered enough material for you to fully appreciate it. But let me go through them, and we'll come back to it as uh, we make uh, we, we encounter various other topics. Okay. So the first principle is no machine should have complete state information. Okay, that that basically says if you centralize all of the information in one machine, it's going to become the bottling. Okay, that's all, all that means. Okay. To the extent possible, you should make decisions based on local, not global information. Okay, local information says, I need to service a request or make a decision. I have all of the information I need to make that decision locally. I don't need to ask 10 other machines what to do. Okay. That's saying local information. Okay. We will encounter this in load balancing. Good example, very simple example is, let's say you have a load balancer in your distributed system, which simply takes a request and always sends it to the least loaded machine. Okay, so that you balance your load across multiple machines. Very standard technique used in distributed system. So if the load balancer actually needs to know the load on every single machine to make that decision optimally every time, that's going to encounter a lot of overheads because you have to keep asking the machines what the current load is at any time. Okay? Or if you do this periodically, you are sometimes going to have stale information, which is not good either. Okay? But what if you could build a load balancer that doesn't need full load information? Can you use partial load information? Can you use randomized algorithms? So all of these are good things to think about. Okay, because the more information you need to know, the more overheads you are going to have in your system. Okay, so, so that's making decisions based on local information. A good design, third good design principle is failure of any one component should not bring down your entire application. Okay, so you should design your system assuming that some things are going to, some machines are going to fail, some software components are going to fail and others will take over. Okay. You might run in degraded mode, which means things will slow down because some components are down. But by and large, your system is still up and running. Very good, important principle. Okay. Centralizing any aspect of your code will immediately violate that assumption because you have what is called a single point of failure. Okay. So if your database runs on only one machine, that machine dies, then there's no database anymore. Okay. That's a single point of failure. Okay. That, that's basically what that means. Fourth design principle says no global clock. Okay, we'll have to wait until we talk about synchronization for you to fully understand what this means. But at a very high level, what this says is you should not assume that the clocks on all of your machines are perfectly synchronized. Okay? Because many design, many not design, but many decisions your distributed system makes are based on timestamps of when certain events occurred. Okay? Timestamp, you typically will use the clock on the machine to assign a timestamp. If you have to compare timestamps across machines, that's always going to be a problem because clocks will never be perfectly synchronized. Okay? So to the extent possible, if you do not assume a global clock, you are going to be better off. Having said that, many applications depend on the clocks to be synchronized using some clock synchronization. Okay? But there's always going to be some error in that assumption. Okay? So a simple example of this uh, where something can go wrong is if you use, let's say, uh, you change a code on uh, for some program and you have a separate build server that's going to compare the timestamp of the source code and the object code and decide how to incrementally compile your code. Okay? Any, any build will actually do this where you like make or some other program. Okay? But if you are actually using an editor on one machine to timestamp files, and some other machine is out of sync, it might not actually make the right decision because the clocks are off. Okay, if you're depending on the clocks to be fully synchronized, that's an assumption you have made where that you are assuming a global clock essentially, which means synchronized clocks. Okay, and then there are some other techniques that I'll go through quickly. The first one says synchronous, asynchronous rather communication. And we will see when we talk about server design, why asynchronous design can actually be more efficient than assuming synchron synchronous design. Okay? Asynchronous I.O. is more efficient than synchronous I.O. for example. But we'll hold off on discussing that until we get to let's say server design and so on. Okay? Distribution, caching and replication are all techniques where you either distribute your data or code, you use caching to ensure that frequently accessed data is stored in memory, not in disk, 
or you simply replicate your data or code. Okay, I talked about all of those already. Okay, any questions here? Yes. So making decisions based on local information, does it mean that uh, it allows us to have data not consistent? Okay. Question is, if you make decisions based on local information, does that mean that uh, you may have inconsistent data? That's not quite what it means. It says that everything I need to know is actually available locally. So when I need to make a decision, I don't need to query some other machines, get more information and make decisions. Okay, That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is, or the more stricter interpretation is, I don't need what's called global knowledge. Okay. Global knowledge is I shouldn't have to know what's happening on every single machine in my system in order to make a local decision. Okay. Okay. So what I'll do for the next two or three slides is just go over a quick history of how distributed systems are evolved. Okay. As part of this history uh, lesson, we'll also encounter many different kinds of distributed systems. How, what they looked like maybe decades ago and what they look like today. Okay, so we'll go through a whole slew of them. Okay. So the very first one there is what is called the mini computing model. Okay. This is basically very early systems where you essentially had one machine. Uh, machines were essentially connected to one or another over telephone networks. Okay, so for a machine to communicate with another machine, it had to actually dial the phone number of that other machine. Okay, it was like just as your fax lines, you had these modem lines, then you would establish a connection, connect, make some, uh, communicate, and then disconnect. Okay, and that's how email actually started. Okay, email is a good example of an early distributed application. You send a mail. Okay, today we assume that the network is always on or mostly on. Okay, you send a mail, your machine will send that to the mail server, the mail server will send that to the receiving mail server, you're done. That's not how mail has worked in the past. You send a mail, it would get queued up, then your mail server will occasionally dial another machine, send your mail to that machine, that machine will route it and so on. Okay? So that's basically how uh, these distributed systems began, which basically meant that connectivity was spotty. Okay? There was a network, but it was not always on, because phone lines meant that you couldn't just keep the phone up all the time, you would incur a phone bill in those days. So you would communicate, disconnect, recommunicate, or reconnect at a later time and so on. Okay. Uh, then you had, of course, local area networks, which allowed those machines to be connected more or less all the time. Okay. But over a wide area, you would not be connected all the time. Okay. Now, over time, that changed. Okay. So the internet came along and there was better LAN, better wide area network and so on. And also the processing power on these machines went up. Okay. So what that meant is rather than having one machine for your entire organization, you could have a workstation on people's desks. Okay. The workstations are powerful machines, they are good local area networks okay. like Ethernet that came along. Okay. So you could get megabit scale networks, not kilobits. Phone networks were ran at tens of kilobits. Now you could certainly communicate at megabit speeds. Okay. That allowed you to do many interesting things that you couldn't do before. Okay. And the uh, so example is a sprite operating system that we will encounter when we talk about process and process migration. Okay, so one of the advantages of Sprite was you could submit a, a, a job to your, your local workstation. If your workstation was busy, it would actually transfer the job to another idling workstation, get the process executed there and send you results. Okay? This is an early example of resource sharing, where you are sharing processing power on idling machines to your advantage. Okay, because you have a network that enables you to transfer code and data relatively quickly, you could do that. Okay, so that was the workstation model. Okay, and the workstation model evolved into client server model naturally where you said, okay, if you can do this, why not have powerful machines whose entire job is to only answer requests. Okay, that's why they're called servers, they provide a service. Okay, and there are clients that may be less powerful that actually rely on servers to do their job. Okay, so, so that's the model that evolved from the workstation model where the more powerful workstations became dedicated machines that provided services and others actually access those services. Okay? And that model is obviously there all even today. 
Yeah, but that's how it evolved. And in this model, you had users at local workstations. There are more powerful machines that we call servers that provided file service where they could store lots of files or print service where the print servers could run databases on them and whatnot. Okay. So from that model, there was also other technology trends and there was another model there called the processor pool model. Okay. So there are two ways to understand processor pool. So in the processor pool model, what happened was the servers were really powerful and the clients were really uh, not so powerful. They were called thin clients. Okay. So in this case, you still have a client server computing, but your server, your client is uh, so limited in resources that it practically depends on the server for everything. Okay. In a normal client server model, your client has some capabilities. It can do, it can run applications locally, processes locally, and whenever it needs to, it will access resources from the server. In a processor pool model, okay, your server is a collection of processors. Clients are really dumped uh, clients that basically send all of their work to the server. Okay. So here, clients are essentially diskless terminals. Okay. In today's world, it's called thin computing, thin client computing, not thin computing, thin clients. Okay. So, so fat clients are clients that have disks, thin clients are clients that may not have any disk, that just have a processor and network that connect to a server to do all of their work. Okay. So, so that's your processor pool model, so pool of backend processor to handle processing. Okay, so that's basically an extreme version of client server computing where all of the processing power is at the server, very little at the client and the server can actually not be one machine but a pool of machine which is why it's called a processor pool. Okay, any questions here? Okay, so from there evolved a whole slew of other models. Okay, there was cluster computing. Okay, where you can think of a processor pool as not one machine with many processors or anything like that, but just a cluster of servers. Okay, so you have essentially a rack of servers that are connected over a high speed network that are clients that make requests of those servers. Okay, and you can you have that model even today where the clusters may be doing a variety of different processing tasks. Okay? Related to, so that's called cluster computing as well. Okay, and then related to that is data center computing where the cluster is essentially not one rack of servers but many racks of servers that sit in a data center. Okay. All large modern distributed applications actually run inside of one, in some cases, lots of data centers. Okay. Each data centers may have thousands of servers in it. Okay. They may run more than one application but they basically run large scale distributed applications. That's a basically an extreme version of what started as cluster computing. Okay. Grid computing and cloud computing are related. In a grid, you essentially have clusters that are connected over a wide area. This is why it's called a grid. So you have your own local cluster. Okay. Many organizations have their own clusters. You connect them up. You federate them over a wide area network. What that says then is each cluster can also send work to other clusters. Okay. So it just looks like one large logical cluster that's essentially physical clusters that are interconnected over a wide area. Okay. So that's essentially grid computing and then you have distributed data centers which are just data centers that are connected over the wide area okay. and uh, cloud computing is just an, uh, one more evolution in that direction where uh, essentially you have lots of data, uh, data centers, each of them has lots of servers. These servers are essentially rented out by the hour rather than owned by any one organization. Okay. So in cloud computing, you can actually go get a server on demand from your cloud, run your application. When you are done, you essentially uh, terminate your server and then you are basically built based on how much resources you have used, how many servers you have used, how much disk space you used, how much network you used and so on. Okay. So it's essentially a distributed data center where you can lease resources and only pay for what you've used. So you don't have to buy an expensive machine if you only need it for a very short period of time. You just rent it for that period of time. Okay. Any questions on this? So these are all variants of your client server and cluster model. 
okay, what became processor pool is essentially turned into all of this. Yeah, and this evolution hasn't stopped at that. Okay? So you have many other models that are also legitimate distributed systems in their own right. And one to consider is distributed pervasive systems. In this case, your nodes in your distributed systems are not essentially computers or what you would normally consider as a computer. Okay? You can think of your car as a distributed system. Okay? Because modern cars have up to a dozen microcontrollers or processors, they actually have a local area network that allows them to communicate. They have sensors that are monitoring various aspects of your car, its engine, tire pressure and all of that. Okay? So essentially now that's an example of a distributed system. You would never think of a car as a distributed system, but modern cars are actually looking like a distributed system. Okay? You can have mobile computing as an example of a distributed system where you have lots of devices. Their clients are not laptops anymore. Okay? They could be phones, they could be your watch, they could be many other devices that's connected to a network. Okay? And it basically it relies on other servers to provide services because it is not as capable, not even as capable as your laptop. Okay? So that's another example. You have sensor networks of all kind where you might have devices in your home, you might have a speaker that actually is a computing device now. You might have light bulbs that can be turned on or off using your phone. So there are all sorts of devices that have computing cap and communication capabilities embedded within them. Okay? But they fit our definition. Okay? They have processor, okay? they have care, they're independent, they're connected over a network. Okay? You, they can service requests or make requests. Okay. So the, oh, this whole slew of devices that you see today, they fall under this category of pervasive system. Okay. There's this field called pervasive computing and a related field called ubiquitous computing. Okay. That says computing is everywhere. Okay. Computing is no longer actually a laptop or a tablet or a server. There could be any device that has a processor on it and communication capability. Okay. You can go buy a TV today, most likely it's going to be a smart TV. Okay, it has a processor in it. It can actually run applications. Okay, it can run Netflix or YouTube and actually access the internet and stream video. Okay? So your TV is also a computing device. Okay, so, so essentially what this is telling you is your computing devices are no longer traditional computing devices. Okay? You can embed, computing has become so cheap and communication has become so cheap that you can embed it into any other device. And now that device essentially becomes part of a distributed system. Okay? Now the design constraints for building these devices and applications on them are very different from writing a web server. Okay? But and they're interesting other constraints because they have very little memory, they might not have a lot of processing power. So programming an embedded device, very different. Okay? Programming a phone at least looks like programming a laptop. It has a, you can build apps for it and so on. They don't look very different. But programming embedded devices is very different. But it's still a type of a distributed system. Okay. Any questions here? Okay. All right. So now I'm going to give a very quick overview of, uh, that was a history overview of uh, distributed systems. Let's talk a little bit about operating systems and how they have evolved. Okay. The evolution is much simpler but has followed the same trend by and large. Okay. Let's start with uniprocessor operating system. That what, what you consider a traditional OS to mean. Okay. There's one CPU on your machine. Okay. You, that's what uniprocessor means. Okay. Your OS kernel runs on that CPU. Okay. And what does the OS, OS do? So OS essentially in this case is a resource manager. The operating system is the software layer that manages the hardware resources on your machine. Okay? It decides how much memory a process gets. It decides which process actually runs on which, uh, when on a processor. Okay? It decides how files are laid out on disk as part of the file system and all of those things. Okay? So essentially it's a resource manager. Okay? It's the layer that sits between the hardware and the application. Okay? So, so essentially the other way to look at it is the OS provides an easier to use virtual interface to the end user. It hides many aspects of the hardware from you. Just as I said transparency in distributed systems hides many aspects of the system. So does the OS. Okay? So when you start an application, 
you don't know where in your RAM that application has actually been loaded. The memory address, all of that you don't need to worry about. The OS is taking care of for you. Okay? Or when you access a file okay, on your disk, you don't know which block of the disk that data is stored. Okay? That mapping is taken care of internally for you by the file system. So you see an abstraction of files and directories. Okay? You do not see the underlying details of disk blocks and pages and caches and so on. Okay, all of that is hidden from you. Okay? So essentially the OS has provided a easier to use abstraction where it has taken care of some of the underlying hardware details and hidden it from the user because you don't need to know or you shouldn't have to know. Okay? Same principle that also applies in distributed system. Okay? Having said that, let's look quickly at some of the architectures you see in operating systems specifically uniprocessor operating systems. The simplest one is called a monolithic architecture. Okay, this is all a refresher from an undergrad OS book, so you should know all of this. But let me go through it quickly. Okay. So in a monolithic architecture, you have one OS kernel that takes care of everything, okay, meaning that the OS is essentially one process that boots up and then it can launch other processes and so on. Okay. Designing operating systems this way okay, is complicated because all of the OS functionality is in one large piece of code that runs as one process, okay, privileged process when you boot up. Okay. It's not at all modular from a software engineering standpoint. Okay. So mo all modern OS kernels are modular in some shape or form. Okay. None, none of them are actually monolithic the way early operating system kernels like early Unix and DOS were built. Okay. There are many ways to making an OS modular. There's the layered design, okay, which is more not used really in operating systems other than the network subsystem. The layered design, it says that your software components are layers, okay, and each layer can only talk to the layer above and below it. So the layers are stacked, okay, and you can only talk to the layer above and below it. Okay. Your TCP IP protocol stack in the kernel is a good example because you have the physical layer, the MAC layer, network layer, transport layer, and so on, and it basically follows the layered design. Other aspects of the kernel actually don't use layered design, okay, but at least the network subsystem does. Okay. Here is another example of another architecture for kernels which is called the micro kernel architecture. Okay. In a micro kernel architecture, the OS kernel is actually a very small layer that is called a micro kernel. Essentially, it provides only very basic services. And everything else that you think as part of the OS actually runs as a standard user process in user space. Okay. In this case, typically a microkernel provides two functionality, inter-process communication okay, and security. It allows other processes to communicate and it ensures protection which prevents a process from going and corrupting some other process. Okay. Everything else is now part of a user process. Your file system is not in the kernel anymore. It runs as a user process. Your scheduler, CPU scheduler runs as a user process. Okay, everything that you typically associate as part of an OS has been pulled out of the kernel and essentially runs as user process. You'll see file server here, process module, memory module, which is doing memory management. Uh, this is actually a real user application. All that your micro kernel is doing is enabling all of these components, which are real processes now, to communicate efficiently to the extent possible. Yeah, yes, question. How is that useful? So you make that as a user process. Okay, question is why is this even a good idea? Okay, why did you pull all of this out? Okay. So here are the things that you can say are good and uh, there are some things that are not so good. But let me start with the good part. Okay. This is a very high, you can at least agree that this is highly modular. Okay. Every component is its own module which runs at its own independent process. Okay. So now if I tell you uh, go and change the memory management algorithm from uh, LRU to something else, as an OS designer, you need to only worry about this process which is its own independent application. You don't need to know anything else about the OS at all. Okay. So from a software engineering standpoint, it's a plus. From a modularity standpoint, it's a plus. Okay. From a security standpoint, also it's a plus. Okay. The big advantage of micro kernels is that they give you better security. Okay. Because in a monolithic architecture, 
if there is a bug in the OS kernel and you start exploiting the bug as a hacker, you can take over the entire kernel. Okay? You own the machine. Right? In this case, if you actually encounter a bug, you can at most only take over that process. Okay? It doesn't actually give you access to other aspects of the kernel, which would be part of one address space in a monolithic kernel. Here, each, each component is its own address space. It doesn't have direct access to other address spaces other than communication. The only way your CPU scheduler talks to the memory manager is through communicating with it. It doesn't have direct access to the data structure. You can't go corrupt things and so on. Okay? So a lot of the proponents of the micro kernel architecture think that kernels ought to be built this way because they're strictly more secure than a monolithic architecture. Okay? There's been a big argument in favor of uh, micro kernels. Okay, so now there must be a bad side to microkernels or some downside, not a bad side rather, but some downside to it. What do you think are disadvantages of this approach? Performance. Okay, performance. So why is performance a disadvantage? System calls. Sorry? System calls. System calls. Okay, somebody else said something. Can you? Okay, interprocess communication. So. So, uh, so that's exactly right. The communication overheads of a microkernel are high and you have to understand why. Okay? So let's say you start a new process. Okay? So in this case, let's say the CPU scheduler will be, not the scheduler, but part of the kernel that sets up a new process will have to make a new process in its data structure. You will have to get the memory manager to allocate memory and so on. Okay? If you had a monolithic kernel, okay, all of these would be function calls from one module to another. Okay? The CPU memory manager will be talking to the process manager and saying, here is some pages, go allocate it. So they are function calls inside a process. Okay? In this case, because the components run as their own independent processes, all of that interaction essentially becomes inter-process communication. Okay? So and you should, now it should be clear that Sending a message from one process to another is a lot more expensive than making a function call inside a single process. Okay? Orders of magnitude more expensive. Okay? So parts of your kernel communicate frequently, which they will, because they have to accomplish a bigger task, then you have slowed everything down. Every time you have a function call that actually crosses these component boundaries, it becomes an IPC message. Okay, you are basically now send a message from one process to another, wait for a response. Okay, that's going to slow your performance down. Okay, so that is certainly a major disadvantage of the microkernel architecture and probably one that actually has not caused it to become as popular as one would like. Okay, but having said that, uh, most of the commercial operating systems you see today at one point or another actually had gone to the microkernel architecture. Okay? OS X started with the microkernel architecture. Windows and uh, whatever is Windows now in the old days started with a microkernel architecture. What used to be Windows NT if you ever heard of Windows NT started with a microkernel architecture. But all of them saw the same problem. Okay? Performance slowed down dramatically. Okay? So what did they do? They basically said performance is so slow, let's take some parts and put it back in the kernel. Okay? So now you make performance better, but some of the advantages you had are gone. Okay? So many of them still have a hybrid architecture where some things have been moved back into the kernel because performance still matters, but for other things they might run as system processes or demons that are their independent processes. Okay. So that's essentially where most of these architectures are today, but they all derive them, uh, their legacy from this architecture, which essentially became popular in the 90s. And then they started walking back from it. Okay. Any questions on micro kernels? All right. So now let me talk a little bit in the five or so minutes that we have remaining about distributed operating system. That was only single process okay, kernel. This is really a course about distributed systems. So we'll talk about what happens when you have to run this OS on multiple machines. Okay. Now, 
uh, we have to basically have the operating system do more than what it did when it ran on a single machine. Okay, it has to manage resources in a distributed machine, a set of machines. Okay, you are no longer managing resources on your own machine. The OS has to deal with resources across machine. If you can make that transparent to the user, you are going to be better off. Okay, but that's not as easy as we will see. Okay, so essentially a distributed OS should no, look no different than a centralized OS from a user's perspective. It should try to manage all the details of the distribution internally by providing transparency. And we'll see how that works in just a second. But uh, So I'll see that there are essentially three flavors of a distributed operating system. Okay? So there's something called a distributed operating system, which is essentially uh, the most tightly integrated version of the kernel. Okay? There's something called a network operating system, which is the least tightly integrated. I'll show pictures that will make what show you what each of these things mean. And then there's a middleware that somewhere sits somewhere in between. Okay, so let me show an example picture. Let me come back to this slide, but let me show you an example picture of what a distributed operating system looks like. Okay, so here are three machines. Okay, they run their uniprocessor kernel. Okay, on top of that runs a distributed operating system kernel. Okay. And everything on that sits above essentially sees all of those machines like single logical machine. Okay? You don't see that there are three machines. There's a process running here. It just looks like one larger machine. Okay? The, uh, where your process runs, where the data resides, which where you get RAM, all of that is taken care of by the distributed OS. Okay? So now you're taken multiple machines, you used an OS layer to stitch together these machines and you are giving to the application an illusion of a single logical bigger machine. Okay? This is the tightest form of integration. You hidden everything from the application. Okay? You will log into one logical machine, not a specific physical machine. Okay? And all of the details of what gets distributed, which processes actually run on machine A versus machine B, even though you don't actually see some of that happening, is taken care of by the OS. Okay? That's the one extreme of a truly integrated distributed OS. Okay? This is what you will see today if you just have a standard laptop or something, which is a network operating system. Okay, in this case, your standard kernel is just augmented with networking features so that you can communicate with other machines. But nothing is hidden for by the OS itself. Okay, if you want to log into another machine, you are going to be able to do so because there's a network connectivity, but you have to SSH to that machine specifically. So you see the presence of all of those machines. Okay, your applications have to specifically communicate to a specific machine, whether it's accessing a server or logging on to another machine. So all that the OS has done is it's enabled communication by providing networking capability. Okay? Practically everything you have today falls in that category. Whether it's an OS that runs on your phone or your laptop, they all have network connectivity. It's essentially a network operating system. Okay? There's no transparency provided for you automatically. Okay. And the middleware operating system is somewhere in between where you essentially are going to take a network OS and say maybe you can add a software layer that runs on top of that network OS which we will call a middleware and hide some of the details for some of the application. You are not going to hide everything for every application. Some applications will just use the regular network OS capability and do whatever they do. But for other applications where it is not necessary or it complicates application design, we let the middleware do what the distributed OS layer did previously. Is that clear? So essentially you still have a network OS which is what we had, but some applications will run this middleware which will hide some features from the application. Okay? So then you have to write the application to the middleware interface, not directly to the OS interface. And we will see examples of middleware later on in this class where they are going to give us these abstractions. Okay, so, so what you have is essentially a distributed OS which is tightly integrated okay, and there are some examples of that that you can actually run and then you have everything else that's network or that's just simply a network operating system and in many cases you just take a network operating system and say I'll just take a commodity OS and run a layer on top of it to hide details when I need. Okay, so that's essentially where uh, most of the operating systems that you see today like. 
Okay, there are indeed some distributed operating systems. Uh, Mozix uh, cluster is a good example. It takes Linux and it essentially adds a distribution layer on top. And you can take a cluster, make it look like one logical machine, you submit jobs to it, it takes care of running the job for you and so on and so forth. Okay. Questions here? Okay, so I'm going to uh, go back. I skipped one slide which was on multiprocessor operating system. We will come to this in a couple of classes. This just takes a network, uniprocessor operating systems and makes it run on multiple cores that you might or multiple processors you have on your machine. It goes without saying that today every operating system that you have on your machine is essentially a multiprocessor operating system because even phones have more than one core. Okay, so it's very hard to buy a single core machine unless you are in the world of embedded computing. Okay, processors that you have on a laptop will be dual core at least or quad core, same thing for your phone, etc. Et so, so by and large, whatever you see running on a standard machine is a multiprocessor operating system. It deals with more than one core or more than one processor, okay, which is more complex than dealing with just one processor, but we'll come to that later. Okay. And then you have distributed operating systems and I'm going to just show you this slide which I won't go into because we ran out of time. This slide just summarizes the various characteristics of middleware operating system on, in the middle, network operating system and distributed operating system. And the main thing to look at is the, the very first row there which summarizes it all which says what is the degree of transparency. Okay, In a distributed operating system it's high meaning you're hiding a lot of details. In a network operating system, you hide nothing. You let the user deal with where the resources reside, how you access it and so on. You just provide communication or networking capability. Okay. All right. So we are out of time. So we will stop here today and continue next time.